Here we're going to focus on the mechanism and stereochemistry of unimolecular nucleophilic substitution, also known as the SN1 reaction. SN1 is a two-step process involving dissociation of the leaving group first from the electrophile, followed by association of the nucleophile to a carbocationic intermediate. And appreciating this intermediate is key to understanding the SN1 reaction. In particular, we want to understand the stability properties of carbocations, what structural factors imbue them with stability, and we want to understand a little bit about their stereochemical properties and how these give rise to, for example, enantiomeric or diastereomeric products in certain types of SN1 reactions. SN1 reactions tend to occur for relatively hindered electrophiles that are either secondary or tertiary, and relatively weak nucleophiles that have the inability to kick off a leaving group on their own. SN1 is a two-step process involving first dissociation of the nucleophuge or leaving group from the electrophile in a D sub N elementary step. The conjugate base of the leaving group is an important byproduct here, but the key intermediate that carries on to later steps in the mechanism is a carbocation, which contains a carbon atom bearing only six electrons and thus a formal positive charge. Because this carbon is deficient with respect to the octet rule, it's a strong electrophile, and the carbocation is a key intermediate in SN1 reactions. This electrophile reacts with the nucleophile, here methanol, in an A sub N elementary step to form what is, in this case, a positively charged intermediate since the nucleophile started out neutral. Deprotonation of this intermediate, often by a molecule of solvent during workup, leads to the final product. On the whole, because the reaction has resulted in the displacement of a good leaving group, the process is thermodynamically favorable. So as we did for the SN2 example, we can place the products at a lower energy than the reactants on a reaction coordinate diagram. Importantly, however, this mechanism involves multiple elementary steps, so we should expect multiple transition states and multiple intermediates. In fact, we see two sets of intermediates, and thus we should expect three transition states, one for the DN step, one for the AN step, and one for the proton transfer, on the reaction coordinate diagram. The slowest step of the SN1 reaction is the first step. This is always uphill in energy, or endothermic or endergonic, because it's pure bond cleavage. Bromine is departing with a pair of electrons and nothing else is happening. And so the transition state of this step is at a higher energy than any of the others. Coordination of the nucleophile to the carbocation tends to be somewhat downhill because we're going from an intermediate that violates the octet rule to one that satisfies the octet rule. The transition state here is slightly lower in energy than the transition state of the first step. And the final proton transfer tends to be heavily favored because of the reaction conditions used. We'll often add enough base that we fully deprotonate that positively charged intermediate so that we're able to isolate the neutral product. It's hard to overstate the importance of this carbocation intermediate to the mechanism of SN1. And carbocation stability helps us explain a lot of the preferences of the SN1 reaction in terms of electrophiles. For example, the fact that this reaction is more rapid for secondary and tertiary electrophiles than for primary electrophiles can be related to the stability of the corresponding carbocations. Tertiary carbocations with three alkyl groups linked to the cationic carbon are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are far more stable than primary carbocations, which are themselves more stable than methyl carbocations. On a reaction coordinate diagram, the primary and methyl carbocations would be far, far higher in energy than where we've positioned the tertiary cation in this figure, which is already higher in energy than the starting materials. And so the primary and methyl carbocations absolutely do not form in SN1 reactions. Resonance stabilization can also be an important factor in these reactions. Any electrophile that can form a resonance stabilized carbocationic intermediate, for example, an allylic halide with a carbon-carbon double bond adjacent to the carbon-halogen bond, is apt to participate in SN1 reactions because of the stability of the carbocationic intermediate. The two key points here then are that more substituted carbocations are more stable, which means that Tertiary carbocations are common in these reactions. Secondary carbocations are possible but not as common. And primary and methyl carbocations are completely off limits 
and SN1 reactions and do not form. Additionally, you should watch out for resonance in the carbocation that would be formed by kicking the leaving group off in a D-sub N step. The stereochemistry of the SN1 reaction is interesting because departure of the leaving group creates a planar carbocation. This means that configurational information, meaning, for example, an R or S label, is completely lost in the first step of SN1. Take this hypothetical substrate, for example. After bromine departs with a pair of electrons, the resulting carbocation is trigonal planar, and the incoming nucleophile really has no idea which side of the molecule the bromine was on originally, leading to a scrambling of configurations in the product. This is often drawn using a wavy bond to the nucleophile to indicate a mixture of configurations. And this is the typical situation when the carbocation is achiral. Notice what happens in this example. After the departure of chloride, we end up with a planar achiral carbocationic intermediate. If the nucleophile attacks from the bottom, we end up with the product shown at the top right of the slide. When the phenyl group and the OCH3 group are aligned as shown, the CH3 ends up behind the plane of the screen and the hydrogen above the plane of the screen. However, if methanol approaches the opposite side of the carbocation, the top side, we end up with the product shown at the bottom right. Notice that the hydrogen and the CH3 have switched places. These two products are enantiomers. They both contain a single stereocenter with differing configurations. And because the step that gave rise to the enantiomers didn't involve anything chiral, we're going to end up with a 50-50 mixture of the two, what's known as a racemic mixture. When the carbocation is chiral, the situation gets interesting, since there is some stereochemical information left in the carbocation even after the leaving group departs. In this case, the top and bottom faces are not equivalent, and so approach to the bottom face would generate this product, and approach to the top face would generate the product shown here. Now, notice that although these products differ at the stereocenter that was actually involved in the reaction, in other words, the carbon that was the carbocation, they are the same at the configuration that was not directly involved in the reaction. Notice that this stereocenter has been sitting here throughout the entire reaction, remaining the same configuration because it's not participating in the reaction. This means that the products are diastereomers. And as we've seen in the theoretical context in earlier discussions of stereochemistry, because these molecules have different energies, we should expect unequal yields of these two diastereomers. And this is where this or does it situation comes in. This is fairly rare to have another stereocenter within a molecule that's engaging in SN1. But it's an interesting stereochemical situation because this gives rise to unequal yields of the two stereoisomeric products. It's a good context for exploring the idea of diastereomers having different energies that we've seen previously.